concern, its significance, the shared legacy which we have in this place. The only exception to the applause uh, understanding tonight will be that later on in this program, as you can see from the program which you have, there will be a time for recognition. There are a number of folks here that have had a significant role in the watershed project up to this point. And we are going to take just a moment to recognize them. And I will ask you at that moment to hold your applause until the very end of that recognition moment. For now, thank you for taking time out of your day for a remembrance. You ready, Mr. Citizen? I'm ready. You see this boat, Mr. Citizen? It's called Jim of the Ocean. You're gonna take a ride on that boat to the city of bones, Mr. Citizen. The city of bones is a beautiful city, Mr. Citizen. It's a city like you ain't never seen. All the palaces are glittering with the light of the sun. Whatever happened to you, you hold on to that boat. You hold on to that boat and everything will be all right. It's moving. The boat is moving. I feel it moving. The land is moving away. You hold on to that boat, Mr. Citizen. Do you see any stairs? If you see some stairs, we can go down to the bottom. I see the stairs. Come on, Mr. Citizen, let's go down to the bottom of the boat. It's dark down here. I hear people talking. Well, what they saying, Mr. Citizen? Do you know what they saying? It sounds like they singing. What they singing? They saying, remember me. With the passage of the first statute pertaining to enslaved persons in 1661 and for the next 204 years after that, Virginia's culture, economy, and society developed around the transatlantic slave trade and then the domestic trafficking of black people. Virginia pioneered an extensive legal framework regulating every aspect of life for enslaved and free persons of color. These laws and the way of life they had upheld and sought to construct were in full force in every town and crossroads hamlet, on every farm, in every factory, in every shop, in every county in Virginia, from the Chesapeake Bay to the Ohio River, from the border with Pennsylvania to the border with Tennessee. They were in effect in that part of Virginia, most commonly referred to as Southwest Virginia, which at that time stretched from the borders with Tennessee and North Carolina to what we now know as Charleston, West Virginia. And I offer two examples of this society which developed. On January the 15th, 1801, the General Assembly enacted a law that enabled the governor to sell an enslaved person who had been convicted of a certain class of crimes or had been sentenced to die for other crimes. This practice was termed transportation. And these trafficked individuals removed, were removed from Virginia into the enslaved labor camps of the Deep South. Proceeds from the, these transportation sales, as they were termed, reimbursed jails and the penitentiary for cost and then compensated the enslaver for the loss of property. And once these accounts were settled, 
All remaining money went into the state treasury. Between 1801 and 1810, 63 enslaved individuals were transported from Virginia. In 1810, the Virginia General Assembly established the Literary Fund to establish public schools, though there was little enthusiasm for truly public education. The Literary Fund was supported entirely from fines levied, the sale of confiscated property, and money forfeited by court order. Any money resulting from the transportation of enslaved people was then deposited in the literary fund. Southwest Virginia. Beginning in the early 1830s, Methodist leaders and civic leaders across Southwest Virginia sought, to build, sought ways to find to build a school that served the people of Southwest Virginia. In January 1836, Representatives of the Methodist Church bought a farm located just north of the Great Road in Washington County, Virginia. On Friday, September the 30th, 1836, a large crowd gathered on a hill overlooking that farm, that farm that we now know as Emory and Henry College. In the ceremony that day, the cornerstone was laid for the college's first building. By April 1838, that building and two others were near enough completed to enroll the first students and to prepare ministers and teachers and civic leaders for service in Southwest Virginia. Almost immediately, the college began to face dire financial situations. And they began to lobby the General Assembly of Virginia for a loan. If they had not gotten the loan, or if they did not get the loan, it was very doubtful that the college could remain open. Beginning in 1839, they petitioned the General Assembly, and they were turned down. In 1842, the trustees of the college took a different tact, and they asked churches, Methodists, across Southwest Virginia to write to their representatives to send petitions to their representatives in the General Assembly. And it worked. On February the 27th, 1843, the Virginia General Assembly decided to loan to the Emory and Henry College $18,000. In today's money, that would be about $750,000. The loan was made from the literary fund. They approached churches. Help us get this money. Help us keep this college alive. And they sent petitions. This petition came from this church, the Newburn Methodist Church in Pulaski County, Virginia. At the time, it was one church in a little town of Newburn, but there were a method, there were circuits of Methodist societies and Methodist class meetings spreading out all around it. At the time, it was one of the largest Methodist circuits west of the New River in southwest Virginia. It would send many students to Emory and Henry College. These men, Philip L. Woolwine, and Robert M. Woolwine, and their brother, Jacob Woolwine, who could not read and write, so he did not sign the petition. These men were instrumental leaders in that church. Philip Woolwine was the first man to sign the petition. 
that went to the General Assembly. And these three brothers helped establish that church some 20 years previous to this. Between 1801 and 1842, Virginia transported 490 enslaved persons out of the state to enslaved labor camps in the Deep South. And the proceeds of each of those 490 sales went into the Virginia Literary Fund. Philip L. Woolwine, Robert M. Woolwine, in 1860, each enslaved nine men, women, and children. Their brother Jacob hired enslaved laborers on a seasonal basis. In the years during Reconstruction, the members of this church actively worked to close down the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church that missionaries had established at the close of the war. Later, these same men forever closed the Freedmen's Bureau School in Newburn. It was the largest Freedmen's Bureau School in southwest Virginia, west of the New River. 100 persons in the day school and 175 persons in the night school. This church and the United Methodist churches that have come from it in that place is my spiritual home. It was here that I was baptized as an infant, and it was here that I first began to discern my calling. And it was in this church that I first learned of Emory and Henry College. And these men, the Woolwine brothers, their blood runs in my veins. My fourth great-grandfather was Jacob Woolwine. His brothers were my fifth great-uncles. In my own life, I have touched the hands of a woman who knew these men face to face and had heard their voices. And this college, this college that would not be here were it not for an $18,000 loan from the Literary Fund. I came here as a first year student in August of 1979. And here I received my college education and this institution opened the world to me. And for more than 27 years, with paychecks from this college, I have fed my family. And for 27 years, I have given this institution my best life's work. And I offer all of this to show that this is not a question of guilt or innocence. There is no innocent ground because all of us are somehow implicated in this complex system that is older than the nation itself. Example number two comes from Pulaski County. It's recorded in the archives of the Wilderness Road Regional Museum. And it is documented because of the work of Emory and Henry students that they accomplished between 2014 and 2016 as part of the Newburn Project. In that system, there was very, very little tolerance 
for freedom. Whole sections of the Virginia Code were devoted to limiting and controlling the freedom of persons of color who were either born free or who had been emancipated. On January the 25th, 1806, the General Assembly mandated that free persons request permission from the county justices to remain living in that county. If the justices determined it was safe for the individual to remain, the individual then had to appear at the court once every year to register as a free person and provide a physical description in paying an annual fee of 25 cents. Free persons were required to renew their status with the justices who could revoke permission at any time. Free persons not granted permission to leave, to stay, had one year, 12 months, 365 days to leave the state of Virginia and never return. If they failed to comply with that, they were subject to arrest and then transportation. If they wished to remain but did not want to risk arrest or transportation, their only option was to re-enslave themselves, to sell themselves back into slavery. Under, under slavery, free persons often found themselves in situations in which they may have been emancipated, but their wife, or their husband, or their child, or their parents, or other family remained enslaved. If ordered to leave the state, this would break those bonds. Just as surely as the trafficking of human beings tore families asunder every single day. In 1856, Frank Harmon was a free man living in Pulaski County between what would become Dublin and Newbury. He was a member of a family of free people. For whatever reason, the county justices determined that he could not stay and he was given 12 months to leave Virginia. Facing nearly certain arrest, Frank Harmon petitioned for self-enslavement to Anthony Owens. On the appointed day, Anthony Owens appeared at the courthouse of Pulaski County, and he paid $1,100 to enslave Frank Harmon. The $1,100 that Owens paid to Pulaski County was forwarded to Richmond and deposited in the literary fund. The record is murky, but all indications are that Frank Harmon's wife was enslaved by Anthony Owens. Rather than leave her and his family, Frank Harmon consented to enslavement by the same man who enslaved his wife, thereby subjecting himself to all of the dangers and the barbarity, all of the uncertainty and the cruelty that undergirded every single aspect of that system. Such love. such grace, such courage. 
In the face of a system of staggering brutality, barbarity, and cruelty, that those who suffered most under it could find ways every single day, find ways to resist and to live out a love of such magnitude, such enormity, seeking every day to preserve the integrity of their families. And it is also that that we are called to honor. and to memorialize and to remember a remembrance. From its founding, Emory and Henry College was enmeshed in the Virginia Slave Society. In the Virginia Code of 1819, there were 98 statues pertaining to slavery, the enslaved, and to free persons of color. After the consolidation and expansion of the Virginia Code in 1849, there were 61 provisions and statues. There was nothing at the college or in Southwest Virginia that was not touched by slavery. From 1836 to 1865, in every aspect of daily life, Emory and Henry depended on the work of enslaved persons. Several were enslaved by members of the faculty. Many others were temporarily hired from their enslavers. The labor of others came as philanthropic contributions to the college from the enslavers. And still, others worked here to help pay for the educational expenses of their enslavers. Some free persons of color also worked at the college. In a great many instances, the college purchased goods peddled by enslaved and free persons from the surrounding community. Regardless of circumstances, all were held within the slave society. This preliminary report from the Watershed Project offers the names of persons of color who were enslaved or who were free and labored at or interacted with Emory and Henry from 1836 through emancipation. Gathered from the college's account books and daily records, this list is incomplete. Persons were identified haphazardly or not by name. Many were identified by their enslaver or by the use of slurs or as an indiscriminate group. Indeed, we will likely never know the names of every person who labored at Emory and Henry under the slave society. In future reports and presentations, the Watershed Project will offer full details for these persons and a place-grounded analysis of Emory and Henry's relationship to the slave society. One central tenet of the slave society was to deny to enslaved and to free persons of color their humanity, reducing them to the status of property. 
this preliminary report undertakes to bring to civic memory the names of persons who otherwise would be lost. The product of more than two years of effort to digitize and index the college's records and to document and gather the names of persons, all has been done by Emory and Henry students as part of the Watershed Project. Readers for this preliminary memorial include Emory and Henry students who have worked to document these names. Other readers are members of the Watershed Project public advisory team, several of whom are descended from persons once enslaved at Emory and Henry. Watson, 1846. Woman, 1861. Jen, June, 1857. Rush, Thomas, 1847. Fred, January, 1859. Alicia, George, October, 1849. George, Alfred, Alan, Laborers, 1860. Laborers, 1843. Mahala. Richard, male, 1845. Sandy, male, March, 1846. Jane, 1847. Laborers, December 10th, 1848. Tom Watson. Sally, male, 1849. Adeline. Samuel. Samuel. 1855. Albert, Jim, 1858. Female, April, 1850. Stephen, 1851. Fred, February, 1863. Moses, Labors, 1860. Margaret, individual, December, 1850. Charles, Cynthia, females. July, 1850. Uh, Frederick, December, 1857. Tom, 1853. Laborers, 1846. Frank. Sophia, female, 1847. Washington. Winston. Females, 1849. Sam, 1847. Individual, March. 1846. Jerry Crafts, 1852. Charles. Matilda. Matt. Harriet. Jefferson, 1854. Jefferson, 1843. Female, July, 1847. Individuals, December, 1860. Ed. Frederick, July, 1843. Jess. 1847. Laborers, 1846. Alf, Laborers, 1857. Jim, January, 1850. Laborers, 1859. Female, May, 1846. Laborers, 1847. Wesley, Will, Jenny, 1847. Jeff, 1846. Danny. Atwood. Jim, 1847. Male, 1851. Male, 1842. Henry. Thomas Jefferson. Laborers, 1851. Laborers, 1863. John, 1851. Individual, 1854. Judy. Caroline. Casey. Charles. Aaron. Alex. Jim. 1853. Charles. Jesse. 1857. Maria. Catherine. Neil. Lewis. Dicey. Earl. 
swiftly. Le Bail, Charles, January 11th, 1861. John, 1861. John, 1853. Mel, September 11th, 1847. Mills, January 1854. Henry, 1859. Judah, Rose. Priscilla, Presley, Labor Race, 1836. Mail, September, 1846. Mandy, Jesse, 1842. Lily, Julia, John, 1848. Heidi, Henry Gordain, 1850. Mary, 1859. Mary, 1846. Betty, Charles, 1857. Frederick, 1861. Nellie Johnson. Gary, June 26, 1857. Charlotte, Harris. Robbery. John, 1855. Individuals, January, 1850. Jane, 1854. Individuals, December, 1859. Mills, August, 1855. David, 1856. Mills, October 3rd, 1843. Laborers, 1846. Mills, April 20, 1850. Solomon, Sarah, Jordan, Mel, 1838, Jim, 1853, Individual, January, 1856, Individual, June, 1849, Nancy, Ben, Laborers, 1853, Harold, Steve, 1859, Hannah, May, 1847. Lucy. Bucket. Bob. Cedar. Camilla. Mill, July, 1849. Mayo, June, 1856. Laborers, 1849. Fred, August, 1863. Laborers, 1845. Polly. Polk, Labor, 1853. Perry. Josh. Mail, January, 1845. Mail, October, 1843. Matt. Jim, 1848. Pangy. Edmund. Cornelius. Mail, 1853. Norman. 1854. Mills, July, 1849. Swaney. Amanda. Anderson. Andrew. Banner. Diana. Beatty. Benjamin. Betsy. Bill. Bill. Laborer, 1862. Peter. Ed. Mel, June, 1847. Mel, November, 1848. Ruthie. Perry. Laborer, 1868. Owen. Laborers, 1852. Nelson. Lennon, 1849. Mel, 1856. Laborer, 1847. Oscar. Laborer, 1845. Laborer, 1847. Patty. Mail, April, 1846. Julia. Joe, 1854. Mail, 1854. Daniel. Winston, 1858. Jim, 1847. Ruby.
I would like first for everybody to uh, introduce themselves, starting if you would like to go first with the next person. I'm Becky Grantham. Mary Lampkin. Mary Lampkin. Debbie Foster. Diane Williams. Hey. Jerry Hill. Mr. Hill, I'll start with you first. Would you uh, please uh, comment on what it was like to be involved with this project? Well, I'm local. I was born and raised here in Washington County. Uh, the project was a remembrance, and I was reminded of uh, in the Bible where it, 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 Israelites were encouraged to remember. Uh, one of the remembrances was here I raised my Ebenezer. It was a marker for where God had bought them from. So as we did this project, I thought about uh, the progress that has been made. Also thought about the names of enslaved individuals. All we had was a name and that possibly some of those people were my relatives. I, I know for sure that my great grandfather was enslaved not far from here. So as I looked at this and listened at names, and I'm thinking, some of these are my people. Um, it, it, it was uh, eye-opening. It was sort of haunting and eerie uh, to, to go through this. But I do uh, appreciate what I got out of it was to remember, um, a, a, as a black person, the strength of our race. And I'll ask you, Mr. Jones, uh, what goes through your mind and heart when you watch this memorial video? One of the things that comes to my mind is that um, I play the what if game. And for me, the what if would be what if I had not come to Emory and Henry speech in 2001? I mentioned that because my knowledge of black history was at a very low point. Not exactly sure what happened. We never talked about it. We never learned it in elementary school. We didn't learn it in high school. We didn't learn it in college either. But by being back in this area, and more specifically being at Emory and Henry, retired from teaching but still in the community, I've learned so much about what it was like back in the 1800s. I share with what my colleague, the other Jerry, just said. Uh, there probably were people that were kin to me as well. I'm not sure uh, exactly who and to what extent the relationship was there. I also felt that I was honored to have a very small part uh, in the uh, assembly of this uh, very detailed and very awe-inspiring project. Ms. Hayes, uh, what is the larger significance of this uh, memorial for this, sh this shared place, this, this community that we have, um, the school, the Southwest Virginia, uh, the United States, and maybe the world as a whole. What's the significance of this? For me, it would have to be, I have a long, long, long history. I've been searching since I was probably about eight, nine years old. I, I can remember asking my grandmother uh, questions about her family. Did you have grandparents? Uh, were they? speak of one set of her grandparents, I thought she might be kin to the king and queen of England, the way that she said their names. And I remember having a little red notebook, and I remember writing down the people's name that took care of her, her mother, my great-grandmother. And 
the people that took care of her, their last name was Cloyd. Benjamin and Melinda Cloyd. And I remember writing that down in the notebook. I guess I put it up somewhere. And years later, I started to do research because I found out that my father was the uh, a correspondent for the Smith County newspaper up in Marion, Virginia. But when he was in high school, he started to write um, about the communities up in Smith County. And occasionally he would even write about Washington County people. And from there, um, I moved to Franklin County, Virginia, went to college at Ferrum College. My twin sister went to school here. Um, and my oldest sister, mom had three of us in college at the same time at Ferrum. And then, like I said, my twin sister played ball here, uh, every sport that a woman could play. Um, I have friendships with the foster family. My mom's sister married into that family. Um, the significance is so deep that sitting there watching um, the names being read and, and the, the written work of the, the names and the jobs that the people had and what they were paid, it tore me up internally. Tears started to stream because I saw the name Nellie Johnson. Nellie Johnson came to Emma. Uh, I worked with uh, Emma's father, Willie Fields, and he told me all about Nellie being a slave here at Emory and Henry. I never associated Emory and Henry with slavery. Today, I, I have... Uh, I learned something new every day, but it, it touched me that someone had the, I don't even know what word to call it, to collect this information, to keep it, and today I learned something new that I had no idea that was all around us and how deep slavery goes. Uh, the significance for me is I watch things today and I see history unfolding here tonight that the people that worked here, black people, probably others too, that wish that slavery had never happened because it had a terrible, terrible um, psychological thing that happened to all of us. I don't care where you were. Uh, where your people came from, it's still with us. And it is so deep that these kind of conversations um, need to be all over this United States. When people start banning books in history because it might hurt someone's feelings, I think about, while I was watching this, the feelings that are here on this campus, they're still, the spirits are still around. Um, it's very powerful. It, it just needs to be talked about more. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Foster, uh, what goes through your mind and heart when, when watching this memorial video? It's hard to believe that something like this happened here, that now we are a part of it. In this little small community, all of this happened. It's, it's disheartening, but I'm glad now that it's coming to the forefront. Ms. Lampkins, <laughs> Ms. Lampkins, what goes through your mind and heart when, when watching this video? It, it fills me with deep sadness because these people who were enslaved here, they had no agency over their own lives they just did what they were told, they, and they were people. They were individuals. They, they had hearts and minds and souls, and they loved and they were loved, but they were diminished to property. And, I mean, and it's 
just like unlike Miss Hayes, I, I always knew that Emory was built uh, by the labor of slaves. I mean, it was the, the 19th century, it was the South, it was America at that time. Who else was going to do it? I mean, who else would have built this campus and this country if it hadn't been for the labor of slaves? I mean, and, and this country and this campus itself are, are built on the fact that white people thought that people of African descent didn't deserve human rights, that they were not, they were just property and, and were just reduced to an it, a thing, like, like a farm animal. And it's, and people don't like to talk about it, but it's real, it happened, and there's proof that it happened, and people just want to act like it, it, it didn't happen. Uh, but, we, but it did. <laughs> um, will you will you speak to your experience of being involved in this memorial? Again, it just it caused me deep sadness because I'm thinking that these people who were enslaved here on this campus and they did what they were told because they wanted to stay alive, right? And so they did what they were told and they had no say in it. And it was just... For me, when I was when I was reading my names, I, I just kept thinking, these are people that no doubt I am descended from. And I graduated from here twice and I love Emory so much, but I feel a little conflicted at times because I know that probably people, well, probably it doesn't even matter if they were my ancestors or not, they were treated so terribly here at this place that I love so much and they faced so many atrocities that no human being should ever have to face. And again, at this place that I love so much. And, it's, and it just, like sometimes I sit and think about it and, and it's just like, oh, wow. <laughs> yes, ma'am, that's very powerful. How, how did this happen? And it's, and it's just like, it's a revelatory moment for Emory to come forward and admit that this was going on on Emory's campus. Yes. So that that makes me glad that it happened. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Sheffy, what is the larger significance of this memorial for the in this shared place? Like what in the shared place being the community, the the campus, what's what's the significance of this memorial? One reading the names of the people, you know, I'd like to think shows a little bit of human humanity that I know that they were not allowed to have. Um, but ultimately, because they were here, we are here now. Um, we would not be here in this place right now without them. Um, and it's a terrible thing to realize and understand, but it is part of who we are. And how was your experience being involved with this, the creation of this? How was your, you, can you speak to your experience? Um, I was not a transcriber and I wasn't the digitizing people and I wasn't on the board or anything. And thank you all for so much of your hard work. Um, I dug out the materials for it and I was really amazed that we were able to find so many names in those college accounts, um, because that's where we found them, were in the account books, um, often sometimes listed next to the butter and the coal and things like that, um, listed underneath somebody else's name as being borrowed. Um, but I was really, truly amazed we found that many names. Thank you. Um, for me, uh, personally, uh, this was very powerful for me because uh, one of the photographs that was shown was of my family, uh, Nellie Johnson, and I grew up in a in a home uh, where where uh, it was it was very it was told daily uh, about my family and their experience going through slavery. I actually still have the spoon that was presented to my great 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 grandmother Nellie Johnson upon her freedom, um, and I was happy to be a part of this. And I feel like life really goes full circle. Um, it, this has truly been a blessing to me. Uh, I'm, I'm happy I get to do it with wonderful people, and I would like to thank Emory and Henry for, for 
making a positive impact uh, and bringing light to what some people would just try to bury. Thank you. What were its features, its characteristics? Who were the people who lived here? And more than a century and a half later, what do we hope to learn? We have been reminded that history isn't was. History is. And as such, we must contend with it, view it from multiple perspectives, and draw from it both warnings and lessons. As we heard the names of enslaved persons being read into the present, we experienced the pain of realizing the full ramifications of what their lives represented and how we must interrogate our own participation in structures of cultural tradition and custom that diminish the humanity of others. It is my hope that the names that were read aren't merely heard once and allowed to disappear from our thinking. We have an obligation to understand the world in which they lived and to open our minds to being affected by their story. The philosopher Martha Nussbaum refers to liberal arts as the great intellectual empathy machine calling us to other worlds, viewpoints, places, and times. Tonight, we have been called upon to use our liberal arts, in our, in our liberal arts uh, and empathic imagination to place ourselves in the subject position of those who are not in control of their own destiny. As the leader of this Emory and Henry iteration today, it's my responsibility to say that the events of the past cannot be ignored or diminished in terms of the very real injustices that were perpetrated. As Emory and Henry grapples with a history that doesn't fit neatly within our self-conception, words indeed seem inadequate. The national conversation of recent years has demonstrated the limits of attempting to match the gravity of historical reality with the words of remorse and apology. To be sure, we renounce the inhumane practice of slavery, but somehow even the explicit expression of condemnation feels disproportionate to the topic itself. I believe that instead of a single statement or expression on the part of contemporary persons, 
who are comfortable and safe in a modern time where the contours of history seem to have but limited pertinence to today, we must commit ourselves to living out the true nature of reconciliation. In our present context, we tend to reduce all things to the individual, but in the Old Testament scriptures, we are given the stories of the people of Israel who participated in collective sin. Time and again, they are confronted with the choices of remaining in that collective sin and thus being separated from the moral grounding of all being. They also have the opportunity to realize the sin, but if they're diminished by it and they can't move forward, then recognition itself is not enough. In fact, the pathway ahead in the Old Testament was always to look to the future and to the beginning of a new covenant. It's my hope that as we as a community here at Emory and Henry look to the future, as the late philosopher Richard Rorty pointed out a generation ago, we are still achieving our country and must therefore look forward to what can be created in light of the recognition of past events. The names read tonight implore us to avoid all that which dehumanizes and with courage and determination to imagine a new social reality based on love, peace, and equality. I want to make it clear, however, that goodwill and virtuous sloganeering are not enough. While this is, to be certain, a form of collective soul craft that we're engaged in tonight, grappling with our past in order to inform our future is also a call to a rigorous series of intellectual questions. What is the nature of forgiveness? Who has moral standing to ask for forgiveness? And who has the moral standing to receive it? What role do subsequent generations have in standing in proxy for actual historical perpetrators of injustice? What do words like acknowledge, denounce, remember, etc., play in the dialogue, especially when the actual injustices seem so daunting and words are so easy to say? What is our intended outcome in community dialogue? And can we even, without doing the work of engagement, what a life of selflessness and service can we bring into being? I look forward to the continuing conversations. It's sobering to remember that we owe it to those whose names were read this evening to embark on these conversations. It is because of their lives and labor stolen that we stand here today. Let us be good stewards of their legacy. Thank you again for those who have participated in this important first step in what promises to be a long process of not only coming to know ourselves as we are now, but in discovering and establishing a new covenant where we come to know one another in the fullness of our humanity. My name is Ryan Vaughn, and along with me, Chana Davidson, and through the Watershed Project, we are digital storytellers of place. My role is to take all of the elements of this important work and to publish it in a way that is open, accessible, and most importantly, honest. It's a huge responsibility, this work. It's hard work. Every day, I think about the scope of this work and consider my own place in doing it. What keeps me going, though, is this thought. Where would we be if we weren't doing this? Then I am reminded of what it means to tell this story. It is my privilege to show you now the open source, born digital platform of the Watershed Project. It is located on Emory and Henry's website under the Appalachian Center for Civic Life, through civic memory, you will find our section. 
This is the beginning of this platform. You begin with a remembrance, which is what you just saw today. From there, you can discover the people, the names that were read. Eventually, you'll be able to click on each individual name and find where they are in our publications and more about them. You can also discover the place, which I will let my colleague, Chana Davidson, tell you about. In the first U.S. Census, taken in 1790, Virginians enslaved 296,627 people, more than any other state. With the end of international trafficking in 1808, Virginia became the leading source for America's growing domestic slave trade. Virginia enslavers trafficked hundreds of thousands of black Americans into slavery into the Deep South. The vast majority of these people were forced marched through Southwest Virginia into East Tennessee, chained and manacled together in couples as small as a dozen or as large as 300 or more. Children, women, men, old and young came along, came along the same road students would have, would have used to arrive at Emory and Henry College. It would have been impossible to be at Emory and Henry and not know the couples making their way to the enslaved labor camps in the Deep South. The Watershed Project memorializes one such couple. This couple of enslaved people bound from the Natchez, for Natchez, Mississippi, left Pennsylvania County on the morning of Saturday, October 18, 1834, 189 years ago tomorrow. Sometime about October 25th or 26th, they would have passed by this place that in two years' time would be Erwin Henry College. Thank you for being here. This is the first iteration of the Watershed Project. Much more, much more is coming very soon. Tonight, we need to recognize some folks. Uh, and it is a heavy, heavy debt I have to every person that is being recognized. Um, and I want to begin tonight by recognizing those that have helped with tonight's program particularly uh, Leah Prater, Haley Arney, Billy Chandler, and Ken Cornett, who have helped with the technical support, who are helping with the live streaming, who are, there are people all over Southwest Virginia and all over the United States that are watching us because of the work of these folks. I'm also grateful to Chana and to Ryan for their work in the Watershed Project and being willing to, to really meet some pretty hard deadlines to have this work that we are able to see tonight and is now available to you. And of course, uh, Shemaya, Noel, and Yasmin Holmes and their evocation of these beautiful thoughts from these artists. In the Watershed Project, it is, it's like a tree that's planted by the water. It, uh, it has deep roots. We, early on, depended on the good help and the advice and the service of our IT staff. And if there's any member of the IT staff here, uh, would you please stand? We were also, and continue to be, indebted to the staff at Kelly Library. So very much of what we are doing interfaces with our archives there, but also with the digital resources which they make available. If there are members of the library staff, would you all please stand? Thank you. I um, have depended on good ideas from a lot of people. And I needed people that I could rely on from the very beginning to give me their honest reactions and to say, this is kind of where we think we're going to go. And the watershed advisory team, the public advisory team, has served in that capacity. It's a dynamic group. Uh, it comes and goes. 
but it is a source of great wisdom and insight to me. If you're a member of the Watershed Advisory Team, would you please stand? I've got several folks here. Yeah, there you are. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have students, Bonner Scholars, Civic Innovation students, other students that are doing civic engagement work, work study students, people that are just volunteering, people that are doing independent studies, that have worked in the watershed projects as indexers, as digitizers, as transcribers. A whole host of people that have brought you these names to you today. If you are some of those volunteers, would you please stand? There we go. Thank you. Our community readers. Um, they have inspired me. You saw them up here on the stage. I'm going to ask you all to stand again so folks can recognize you. Thank you so much for being a part of this. Um, Rebecca Grantham. Rebecca? How many times has she opened the door and said, come in, I've got a book. And then the beauty of the A Remembrance piece. It, the, it, the, it is a beautiful work. Tyler Irving. Thank you. And then the work of going page by page in dozens of books. every day, every class period. Civic Innovation 350, spring of 23. Would you all please stand? Give all of these folks a round of applause, please. I was talking about a time. It's so hard for me to believe in it. Some things go, some things just stay. I used to think it was my memory, you know? Some things you forget, other things you never do. But it's not. Places, places are still there. If a house burns down, it's gone, but the place, the picture of it stays, and not just in my memory, but out there in the world. What I remember is a picture floating around out there outside my head. I mean, even if I don't think it, even if I die, the picture of what I did or knew or saw is still out there, right in the place where it happened. Can other people see it? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Someday you'd be walking down the road and you hear something or see something going on so clear. And you think it's you thinking it up, a, a thought picture, but no. It's when you bump into a memory that belongs to somebody else. Where I was before I came here, that place is real. It's never going away. Even if the whole farm, every tree and grass blade of it dies, the picture is still there. And what's more, if you go there, you who never was there, 
If you go there and stand in the place where it was, it will happen again. It will be there for you, waiting for you. If it's still there waiting, that must mean that nothing ever dies. Nothing, nothing ever, ever does. does. To know a place deeply is to know time in a different way. Mount Rogers, White Top, Clinch and Walker Mountains in the blue distance, the clay baked, it, baked into the bricks of the oldest structures on this campus, the limestone outcrops in the woods behind us here, all remind us that this, is, this place is older than anything that we can measure with a calendar. Tonight, when you leave here and you look up to the sky, if there is a break in the clouds, you will see light from the stars that was generated and began its journey here when the limestone was only mud and sand at the bottom of a vast sea. The first peoples of this place lived and thrived here without clocks and calendars. They understood this place as an interwoven and interconnected living reality from the light of day to the dark of night to the passage of the seasons to the spirit of those who lived here before them. In Western culture, derived as it is from European influence, is one of the ways we use clocks and calendars is to structure our world and our lives. We have learned to use clocks and calendars to separate the past from the present. To give us a way to think of the future is something tangible, and the past is something irrelevant. But in the Earth's long story, in a place's long, long history, the kind of time that clock and calendar give us is very new and very inadequate. To know a place deeply is to know as the earth knows, as the landscape knows, that nothing is past. Just as the light from the stars and the mud and the sand that gave us the limestone and the clay that made the books is all here now, nothing is past. All of time is now. All of time is here. Place time. And if all of time is present here, all of the people of this place are here. All of the people who have lived and worked and studied and learned and taught and wept and laughed and grieved and loved and hated. All of them here, all of the time. We use many words to describe that reality. The reality that is beyond the dimension of clock and calendar. We call it the universe, creation, evolution, place, earth spirit, kairos, the divine, Brahma, Yahweh, Jehovah, Allah. Regardless of the name that we use, this place calls us into a generosity of heart, into a generous and enduring remembrance. 
lived out in ordinary ways every day in this place. There are moments when the heart is generous and then it, and then it knows for better and worse our lives are woven together here one with one another and with the place and all the living things. Thank you and good night. <laughs>